Hello and welcome to the First Right Podcast, a weekly conservative news show brought to you by Restoration of America. I'm your host, Jerry Ewalt, and today we are blessed to have on the show Steve Dace, a renowned author, podcast host of The Steve Dace Show, and executive producer of the film Nefarious, based on his book, America, A Nefarious Plot. All right, Steve, I know you're a busy man, so thank you so much for coming on the show today. Happy to do it, man. You bet. Thank you. Yeah, well, you you have a very successful podcast, The Steve Day Show on Blaze, uh, Blaze Media. You're the author of, of several books, uh, several books that talk about all the ills that face our country over time. And I think if we were to spend all day talking about what's going wrong with our country, we would, we would not have enough time, absolutely. So what I'd like to do is focus your energy on the single biggest problem that we all face in this country and as an individual, which is, of course, spiritual warfare and, and also the, mm -hmm. the topic of the movie that you just came out with, uh, Nefarious. So tell me a little bit about the, the, the premise of the, uh, of the book and the movie and, and talk a little bit about that battle that we're, we're, we face ourselves right now. Well, I, I completely agree. Ultimately, our issues are spiritual here. And as we say on our show a lot, um, the outcome is going to go one of two ways, revival or bust. And when I wrote A Nefarious Plot, the, movie, the book that inspired the movie Nefarious uh, back in 2016, um, I, I wrote it in, in the voice of a demon named Lord Nefarious as if he was writing in the past tense. He had been tasked by the enemy with the uh, destruction of the United States of America, and he was so confident that his plan was successful, he's going to reveal it now and put it right in our faces because our inability to or unwillingness to turn back away from what he has done to us will convince his master, the devil, that his plan was successful, and they, they may now move on to the next stage of their quest for dominion of, of the earth. And, and if you go back and read that book now, it is small p, prophetic. Uh, I mean, it, it is absolutely an outline of, of, of really a, a systematical out, outline of where we are as a people today and how we got here. And so when we did the movie version, Nefarious, we, we, the, the movie is a prequel to the book. You know, we, we couldn't just do a movie based on the book completely because mm -hmm. the book is 240 pages of a demon just basically screaming at you, right? So how do you turn that into a movie? And so the, the book the, or the movie tells the story of how the book came to be, what the origin of the book is. It takes you right up to the publishing of the book. And what we wanted to do with the film is confront a culture that is right now on the uh, on the lip of the mouth of madness and is is dipping more than a toe in the water and contemplating belly flopping into that abyss and to try and grab that culture and say, do you truly understand the decisions you're making, the choices you're making, uh, where the, 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 the ideas and values you consider to be progressive truly come from. They're not progressive. They're actually regressive. You're actually taking us back to a, a pre-Judeo-Christian understanding of the world, a, 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 a pagan or pre- or unbiblical worldview. And, and so these things have all been discussed and debated before, and the Bible won. And so you're, you, there's nothing new here. Uh, this is... This is um, this is just old dark magic that you want to revert us to. And we wanted to introduce people that had kind of been told that they're uh, the people we've been waiting for and we're evolved and sophisticated now to acknowledge things like good and evil and to confront that culture with real evil, not the cartoon variety or the Saw variety mm -hmm. or the Jason or Freddy variety, but the real thing. And, I, and I'm very thankful that I think we did that extremely effectively in the movie Nefarious. You, you absolutely did. And I think you, you, there's a lot to unpack there. And I think the first thing I want to draw out is, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes 1.9, 1, 1, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing new under the sun. This has all been done before. So your point, this is a regression. We're regressing back to the times of the Bible. It says the days of Noah or whatever you want to call it. It's a regression back. The Bible already won. Our country was found on Judeo principle, uh, Judeo Christian values, but now we're starting to revert back. What I like about your movie, right, is there's so many Christian movies out there that kind of give you that happy storybook ending. But I like how you left the end of the movie. It's a cliffhanger. It, it's not a storybook right. ending. It's a cliffhanger right. because we don't know what's going to happen in our own country, uh, let alone this person's life uh, the, uh, in the movie. 
I mean, I literally put in my contract, no cheesy conversion scenes. I think a lot of faith-based movies have been ruined by that. Yeah. And this idea that everything's got to w- w- end with a rub of the belly and a pat of the head. And, and you just go off into the world now and understand that, that, that Jesus is one. Well, Jesus did win, but how did he win? Torture, execution. Yeah. Um, you know, before we get to a resurrection, we had to have a good Friday and an execution. And so, you know, Jesus looked at his followers and said, if they did this to a green tree, what are they going to do to you? I think a lot of Western Christians have been, um, have been catechized with sort of this antibacterial wipe version of the scriptures in the Bible. And that a lot of things that the Bible has to say, if a pastor opened up and said, today's scripture reading is blank, people would faint and say, that's profane, that's terrible, that's ugly, we can't possibly talk about that stuff. It, we wouldn't want children to hear that, it's got to be nice. Um, and I think back to the great line from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe before they go to meet Aslan the Lion for the first time. And, and Lucy says to Mr. Beaver, it, Aslan, is, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver says, of course not. He's a roaring lion. Of course he's not safe. But he is good. And, and our, we, we have, you know, as Francis Schaeffer said another, in another era, our God is too small. I would, I, would, I would amend it. Our God is too safe. We have mm. constructed a God that makes things um, antiseptical as opposed to getting his hands dirty and asking us to do the same. And so what, what we wanted to do with this movie is by confronting people with the idea, the objective idea of evil again, it would, it would compel people to now consider the, their need for good, right? You don't need salvation unless you acknowledge that you are a sinner. And so people, we need some more of the old-time religion back, that yeah. maybe if this was another era when, 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 if maybe the church was stodgy and was, was, was too harsh in some areas, that maybe we needed to be a little bit more, quote-unquote, purpose-driven. But in this era, everybody's got Jesus for a buddy. They've all heard the softer yeah. side of Sears. They've all heard that. And we have to understand the signs of the times. And what people need in this era is some of the old-time religion. It is time for, to make Jonathan Edwards great again, sinners in the hand of an angry God. It is time to make people understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom again. And, and, but ultimately, you won't turn to the light unless you see the dark, either in yourself and or surrounding you. And so this is an entry-level evangelistic exercise. First, mm-hmm. admit there is evil. Then admit you alone don't have the cure. And James still at the end of the movie still thinks that he does, right? right? He tells Glenn Beck at the end of the movie, well, you know, I don't know that I'm a believer. And I came up with this great book and plan of, of how to beat nefarious. And then at the end of the movie, when he walks out of that studio, he is reminded one more time, there are no, there are no free agents. There is no net neutrality here. You're on one side or the other. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Uh, and again, that's why this movie and the book, right, is 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 so important. You referenced C.S. Lewis just earlier. I mean, this is a screw tapes. I think you even called it. It's a it's a sequel to Screw Tape Letters. I know you didn't write. Yeah, screw I wrote tape it as letters. a as I wrote it as a sequel homage to the Screw Tape Letters. Yeah, exactly. And it you, it's so important to get the perspective of the enemy because too many Christians out there neglect him, push him to the side. And again, our focus should be on Christ. There's no doubt about that. But you have to understand who is against you and what they're doing mm-hmm. to you. And you're, and the movie does a, a perfect job of really showing that. And even at the end, to your point, the main character still doesn't get it, doesn't, still doesn't understand that it's God alone that's going to get him out of this mess. And he keeps going under attack because he forgets he doesn't get to see that. Even the greatest coaches in the history of sport, you think of John Wooden, for example. He was famous for saying he didn't watch a lot of film of the other team because I had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Billy and, and Bill Walton. I didn't have to, right? Okay. Right, so right. I mean, if you've got the king of the universe on your team, you don't have to like lint in the naval ponder the enemy and his schemes. But you know that little that program that John Wooden kept rolled up in his hand all those years. You know what that was? Written on there was the free throw percentages of everybody on the other team. So in case at the end of the game they had to foul to to make the game go on and to not lose the game, he knew who to foul. Who to foul. So even though Wood, even though Wooden said, Wooden said, "Hey, I've got the best players, so I don't need to watch a ton of your film." It, it wasn't like he did no recon of the other team either. He didn't do any research at all. He put the <laughs> emphasis on his team, but he knew what he was up against yeah. still at the same time. So if there are certain if there are certain sects of Christianity or certain eras of Christianity where we become completely fixated on confronting the darkness and being fearful of it, in this era, we have gone way too far the other way to total and, and willful ignorance of it. Yeah, I, one advice I give Christians all the time is go back and read the first chapter of the book of Revelation. 
See, see the description that Jesus is under and what he looks like. He's coming back and he's serious and he's not messing around anymore. And he's going to take care of business. And that includes the enemy that is working against us and everything that we're doing. Amen. Amen. So, so Steve, you, um, did you write this book and, and obviously the movie that, that leads up to the book as a bit of a red pill moment for so many Christians out there who don't understand this? Yes. Now, I'm a little leery of the red pill term. <laughs> it, because it's 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 kind of become now, you know. I, I was uh, I was all about that life for many years, but the red pill term has now kind of become like Bronze Age paganism, if you know what I'm saying. Like, you know, um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do things the uh, the Roman and Greek and Spartan uh, way as opposed to the Jesus way. But I like the context in which you chose it. Fair um, enough. I, yeah. I do I I do I do think. Again, way too much of the church is soft and it is safe, and therefore it's really of, of no purpose in a fight, you know. And yeah. it, it, in a fight, there are bruises, there are cuts. You know, the prop, the first prophecy that is given uh, in the scriptures: all right, you will crush the head of the enemy, and he will bruise your heel. That that didn't happen, you know. No one came and sprayed some, you know, uh, some eco green friendly cleaning spray and just wiped the enemy away. No, we right. had to be crushed. OK, and I, 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 I mean, we the way Jesus looked on the cross, what get what Mel, you know, what he depicted 20 years ago is I've seen some studies that have shown it's maybe 30 percent of what actually somebody that had been through that level of scourging and torture and crucifixion actually would have looked like in the last hours of their life, dying of asphyxiation up there in the sun on that in that heat. If, if that if what was truly being done in, in that in, to Christ, we had to actually see, I think we'd be largely revolted by it and could not handle it in our current sensibilities. And we would find it, you know, uh, grotesque uh, and, and gory. But ultimately, we no one wins a fight without drawing blood. And, and there's never been a fight one in the Bible without drawing blood. God said to his people, Christ says to his people in the Old Testament, go into Canaan, you're my urban renewal program, evict them. They didn't just nail an eviction notice to the door, brother. They fought them hand to hand with swords in war. And then in the New Testament, that same God, Christ, he spills his blood, all right, to evict the enemy from us. There is no victory in any fight, any battle, without some bruising, without somebody bleeding. And there won't be in this one either. There's, there's no doubt about that. And this is where it all begins, right? And that's, and that's why I wanted to focus the interview on this specific topic, because if people understand the spiritual warfare that we're under, once they understand that and what to do about it, which is turn to Christ, uh, then, then you understand it manifests itself in reality. And, and there's probably no bigger arena than politics that it manifests itself into, which I know you, yes. you actually bridge both, right? Me, meaning it, it's a bridge. Of course it is. It's, it, it's all around us. So how does the spiritual warfare reflect then on all the pol political upheaval and craziness that we're seeing in our country? We are living in an era now where things that we used to complain about, we miss. For example, we used to, we used to complain about politicians only doing the right thing because it would get them reelected. So they would just do it for a time in an election year and then abandon us. We miss that now. Now we can't get them to do the right thing at all. Now it's like they don't care if they get elected or not. They just, they just, they, they, they just want to screw us. Just, and that's the point. Um, we, we used to, we used to complain if we came home and, and, and early from work and our teenage son or daughter, uh, we caught them having sex with their boyfriend or girlfriend and fornicating in our home. We used to complain about that. Now we almost miss it. We're like, I can't even get my son to even ask a girl out. Yeah. And my daughter just came home with a nipple ring and she now thinks her name is Alfred. And, and, and turns out she's been a man in a girl's body this entire time. And here's why that happens. Sin, sin is when we choose to exploit the desires, the drives, the impulses that God puts in us, the gifts that he gives to us. We choose to exploit those things beyond the proper application of, of, the, of, of the guidance that God gives us for what to do with those things and how to utilize those things. When we sin, it's when we exploit those gifts. We're, what we're doing in this day and age, brother, is we're denying those gifts. When I was a kid, there was a famous movie, Wall Street, and the character Gordon Gecko got up and said, greed is good. And so we've gone from, um, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. Greed is not good. Materialism for materialism's sake is not good. It is the love of money is the root of all evil. But now in this era, 
people, I don't want to start a business. I don't want to take a risk. I don't want to try to be successful on any level uh, because I might fail. So let me just stay home and live with mom and dad and be a ward of the state. It is not a good idea um, to find to, to be pro- sexually promiscuous, as you know, the story that we just heard this week of, of Trevor Bauer, the former Cy Young Award pitcher who lost yeah. his entire career, apparently over a false allegation. But he also walked into that situation by being promiscuous. Right. But we've now gone to I don't even want to ask a girl out. She might reject me. I don't the average American. It is far more likely a 25 year old male in America is still living at home with a parent than he is living in another home with a wife and a child. That's never happened in American history before. This is when we go from exploiting the drives and gifts and ambitions that God gives us to denying them. When we're exploiting them, that's human sin. When we're denying them, that is demonic. That is, we are now acting outside of the image in the one in whose in, in whose image right. we are made. We are denying that. That's direct demonic influence. I think we're totally depraved. I don't think people can just of their own free will automatically abandon sin and choose God, that he must take initiative for us to know him. But that's not the same as utterly depraved, where we're now just incapable of wanting to even do good things and be kind and be generous and be significant and and be compassionate or empathetic. And that's that's when we get into the mnemonic, brother. And I think that's the era that we are living in now. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think you just perfectly summed up what we experience in the physical world as a result of the the spiritual warfare that we're under. And if people think that we're going to have a revival or even a restoration of our country, uh, that is only possible if people recognize the battle that we're under and you turn to Christ. There's no other way around it. These attacks are too great. We can't solve this on our own. So, Steve, I, I want to I, I want to thank you uh, again for your passion. Uh, you get me fired up whenever I hear you talk. So this has been a real pleasure for me. Uh, <laughs> keep up the battle. Uh, God is with you, and uh, we'll keep praying for our country. Thank you. Very kind. Same to you, brother. Thank you. All right. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in and supporting conservative media. Don't ever forget that by working together and staying diligent, we conservatives can bring our country back to true greatness. Until next week. Let's all keep praying that God will continue to bless America. First Right, a new kind of news summary without the liberal slant. Every morning, in your inbox, always free. Subscribe by texting First Right to 30161. That's First Right, all caps, one word, to 30161.